were not safe. They were not seismically safe. And so she motivated essentially a mom's network um, to lobby the city of Berkeley to retrofit all of the, uh, Berkeley's schools so that they are earthquake safe. And the city went ahead and, and they did that. That program then got expanded out to look at other seismic related issues in the city of Berkeley um, that could be uh, that were a problem and come up with solutions for them. And this led to this program, Get, Red, Get, excuse me, Get Ready Berkeley, um, which is trying to improve the overall safety not only of public buildings like schools and city hall and things like that, but also of private buildings as in individuals' homes. And you'll see in a moment how successful those programs in UC Berkeley have been. Again, individuals that make a difference. Oh, but here, and so here is the slide of the retrofit rates for single family homes in a range of a whole bunch of, uh, of Bay Area cities. Okay? And so the black bar shows complete retrofit, and then this yellow bar indicates additional homes that have been partially retrofit. And you, know, you can see that the percentage of homes in Santa Clara is the lowest. In Berkeley, it's the highest. How was it possible to get uh, so, so much, a much higher fraction of people in Berkeley retrofitting their homes? Um, there's two reasons. First of all, activism by individuals. <laughs> Today of all days, I don't need to tell you that Berkeley is known for its activism. Um, Berkeley is known for its activism um, for a whole range of issues, including, believe it or not, seismic safety. Um, so that was one, one piece. Um, but also, this activism was translated into incentives, okay, financial incentives. And specifically, what the city of Berkeley did was whenever you buy a house, you pay a, a tax on the purchase price of the house that goes to the city. And the city would give you some of that money back if you spent it on retrofitting your house. Okay? And it's not enough money to retro completely retrofit your house, but it's enough money to partially retrofit your house. Some homeowners, of course, would then spend some of their own money to complete the task. Others would just do a partial retrofit. So that's part of the reason that there's you know, a, lot, a large number of people who've done a partial retrofit. People say, well, why not? I'll take the money back and I'll spend it um, on a retrofit. I'll do as much retrofitting as this money uh, will allow me to do. So that's the financial incentive um, that the city put in place and is now being used by homeowners in the city as, as houses change hands. They typically get retrofit a little bit, if not completely. And so over time, um, the overall standard of, of seismic safety for family homes is increasing pretty significantly uh, in, in, UC, uh, in Berkeley, the city of Berkeley. Okay, so apartment, that leaves apartment buildings, right? So that was single family homes. So what about apartment buildings? Again, these are the buildings that you guys care about because you're probably going to be living in one of them during your time here um, at Berkeley. So wood frame apartments, so here's some pictures of typical wood frame um, apartments. They'll be responsible for 66% of the uninhabitable housing following an, a Haywood earthquake scenario. So these apartment buildings are a real issue. Um, a large number of them are likely to be damaged to the point that you can't live in them um, after an earthquake, and that's largely due to this soft story kind of issue. And so Berkeley is also trying to do something about um, this uh, soft story uh, problem, and they have an inventory of soft story buildings. Okay? So what that is, it's literally a list of street addresses of buildings that are hazardous because they're soft stories. So there's no program in Berkeley right now to actually force retrofits of these soft story buildings. Of course, it's up to the building owner. The building owner typically doesn't live in the building, so there isn't quite the same motivation to do a retrofit as there are for most people's homes. So what they have done instead is they have a list. You can find it. Go onto the Berkeley website, search for soft story, and you will find this list of, of buildings um, that are soft story. So you can identify when you're looking where to live next year if it's on that list. Yeah. Wow, I've never been asked that question before. So the question was, a lot of the fraternities have basements that are completely open for parties. And so is that a hazard? Um, I don't know the answer to it. it. It entirely depends on how the building was constructed. Don't know. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly, that's a good point. So I made the point several times during the class that wood frame houses are relatively safe. What I, and now I'm saying wood frame apartment buildings are not. So the distinction here is wood frame houses, when I'm saying they're relatively safe, what I mean is that they have a certain amount of flexibility. So when, when the earthquake shaking occurs, the, the beams, the posts and the beams can all move with respect to one another. So they can respond to the shaking. The nails perhaps get pulled a little bit, but it can flex and it doesn't break. That's what I meant. Now they're only safe if that wood frame structure is bolted onto the foundation. So that's what the retrofit for single family homes is about. It's typically about bolting the wood frame of the building onto the concrete foundation. So once you've done that, you're in pretty good shape. So that's one of the key, the two key things for a single family home are bolting the wood frame onto the basement and putting what's called cripple walls. That's another detail, I'm not going to get into detail now. Um, this case, the wood frame apartment building it's primarily due to soft stories on the ground floor. Okay? So yes, wood frame buildings are good to be in if they're properly, you know, if they have a consistent strength throughout the entire vertical height of the building and they're bolted to the foundations. Okay, great question. Any other questions? Okay, so remember this, you know, go and search for this list when you are looking um, at a place to live. Even if it's just to do a very small um, societal experiment on yourself, find out when you're looking where you're going to live, find out if it's listed, if any of the, the apartment buildings you're considering are listed as soft story buildings and ask yourself how much of a difference that makes. Okay? It's, it's, this is the real challenge. Of course, there are many factors that come into play when you decide where to live. But at least be informed. So go and look at um, uh, the soft story list and see, and see what's on it. So the way that we deal with this, what, the way the, what we have to do to deal with the earthquake problem is, of course, this broad brush um, uh, comprehensive um, solution. And so there are multiple pieces to this comprehensive solution. The first is to understand the risk. Okay? We need people to understand the risk. You guys now understand the risk. That means you are far more likely to take actions to reduce the, uh, the risk to yourselves and the people around you because you're informed about the risk. You have to be able to increase the understanding of the risk. The people who actually retrofit their homes, um, they typically believe that the risk of an earthquake in their neighborhood is high. Okay? So they recognize that there's a real risk here. Um, in their neighborhood specifically. They, often, they usually have seen maps of ground shaking, the predicted ground shaking, so you guys are in that category. You've seen maps of ground shaking. And then typically they've also experienced a major damaging earthquake, such as the Loma Prieta earthquake. The Napa earthquake, of course, lots of people think, oh, that didn't really affect me. Well, not people in Napa, but people in the rest of the Bay think it didn't really affect me. People need to actually experience a serious earthquake, and then they recognize um, how severe the risk is. It's very difficult to recognize that without, without that experience. And then the people who have done that, these, the people in this category who then went ahead and did a retrofit, they typically, of course, also have a plan. They have food, they have water stored, and they have a plan for how they're going to respond to earthquakes. The second piece of this comprehensive plan is that there needs to be clear explanations of what, um, what should be done. Okay? So what do I need to do to my house? Do I need to bolt the foundation? Do I need to put in the triple wall? Um, and that's because the most common reason that's given for not doing anything, even when people want to do something or think they probably should do something, is they don't know what to do. So there needs to be a very clear message as to what needs to be done. And if you remember at the beginning of the class, I had you read um, the USGS putting down roots in earthquake country booklet, and it laid out very clearly, I think, the kind of things that people should think about um, uh, doing. And so there's a high correlation between those with a college education and those who retrofit.
you know, if you have a college education, you're much more likely to be capable of doing that. And again, it's those individuals who are the people who are most likely um, to retrofit. And then finally, dollars talk is the bottom line. There has to be financial incentives. I just gave you the example in Berkeley um, that this tax uh, rebate um, is a big piece of why Berkeley is uh, doing relatively well when it comes to retrofitting the buildings. And typically, it is wealthier families who are more likely to retrofit. That, that's just the reality. And so I also kind of covered this. But the reason that Berkeley um, has been so successful, I'm talking about the city of Berkeley now, sorry, not the university, um, is because of the, there's this high risk perception. First of all, people do recognize um, the risk, typically in Berkeley. And part of that is just seeing the city go through the process of retrofitting its buildings. If the city thinks this matters and is spending money on it, then perhaps I should be paying attention to it. And um, there's a widespread knowledge of what to do. Uh, the sort of relative education level of people living in Berkeley is high um, for obvious reasons. Um, and then city programs, the city programs that they put out there to provide these financial incentives are what really, um, really makes a difference. And this really matters, okay? There's a lot at stake when it comes to taking these kinds of mitigating measures. When we estimate the kinds of losses, sorry, I seem to be losing my voice. When we estimate the kinds of losses that uh, we expect in these major damaging earthquakes, a repeat of the 1906 earthquake, in terms of just damage to buildings, if it's estimated to be about $50 billion of loss to buildings, and RMS Risk Management Solutions, a private company that estimates risk for companies, when they go and put together, try and estimate all of the losses, you end up with a number that's around about $200 billion, okay? So there is a lot at stake um, when it comes to these kinds of events. The event that perhaps we're a little more concerned about, um, thanks to our proximity, of course, is a magnitude 7 earthquake on the Hayward Fault that would rupture um, not very far um, from, from here. Um, the estimate of that is $23 billion um, due to damages, uh, sorry, due to uh, damage to buildings, okay? If you look at the factor change, you go from 50 billion to 200 billion, all losses, typically a factor of four in round numbers greater than the losses to buildings. So if we look at the Hayward example, we're talking about $100 billion of losses due to a magnitude 7 earthquake um, on the Hayward Fault. So that's less than a repeat of the 1906, but the likelihood of a magnitude 7 on the Hayward Fault is much higher than of the 1906. So this is actually one of the most likely, or uh, well, this is the greatest amount of risk overall, because the risk, no, sorry, the hazard on the fault is higher than the Hayward Fault, um, than, I'm sorry, the hazard on the Hayward Fault is greater than the hazard on the San Andreas Fault, even though the cost is less, right? So this is the scenario um, that, that represents the most risk um, to, to Berkeley as a whole. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, the goals here of the class, what I tried to do, I sort of said this at the beginning of the class, is to inform the future leaders of our society, that's you guys, um, about the various hazards associated with earthquakes. Okay, you should now have the necessary information to make intelligent decisions about the hazards that are, that are out there and the risk. The hazard is the earthquake hazard, the fact that the ground is going to shake, and then the risk is when you take that and you convolve that with the buildings and the kind of damage um, that we have on the buildings. Hopefully, you now have um, all of that. So your charge now, of course, is to go and be responsible with that information, to use that information yourself in your own decisions, and to share that information with uh, with the people around you. All right, thank you very much. Don't, don't forget, those of you with my shake, to come and get your mug. <laughs> <laughs>